life. Hi, um, we're going to start our science cafe talk today. And uh, we have the speaker, Alex Lakin. He got his uh, PhD here or in the other uh, in the computer science department. And currently, he's a research associate uh, at the business school. And today, he's going to talk about um, self driving cars. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for <laughs> Thank you for organizing such a wonderful event. I think it's very important for people to you know, talk about cool things like self-driving cars. And uh, uh, that's what I'm going to try to do. And uh, I have some entertaining videos that I'm going to show and uh, talk a little bit about uh, how I got interested in this topic and how I got involved. And also some technical details, but not too much, not, not too much computer science. Uh, also, there are a lot of interesting social and the legal aspects that people are talking. You can probably hear on the radio or TV about what's going to happen if we get self-driving cars and how it's going to affect our cities and infrastructure. Uh, so, uh, just just one note: if you have any question at, at any slide here, just feel free to interrupt me and uh, you know just sort of turn it into this discussion. Um, let me start by just. Uh, briefly talking about how I got in touch with this uh, topic. So I was a student of computer science and uh, uh, we, had, we had a team of people who got involved into this uh, autonomous car racing uh, challenge that was uh, created by DARPA. And uh, for those of you who don't know, DARPA is uh, the guys are behind creating internet, right? This is the advanced research agency for the United States military. and they. Once in a while, they throw some money into creating cool things like the internet. And you know, originally they have some some military goals in mind, but sometimes it sort of, uh, when it comes to fruition, there is a lot of uh, civil civil benefit from it. And so uh, there was a group of people with a uh, Steve Johnson who's here uh, at, at uh, IU. And also a bunch of folks in Purdue, and I think there was a, a conglomerate of people who were trying to build a self-driving vehicle to compete in the race. So let me just tell you a few words about the race itself. So what that DARPA wanted to do is, first they started in 2004, they wanted to have a car that would drive itself through the desert, 150 miles. Uh, it was roughly from LA to Las Vegas. It was completely off-road, so you'd see boulders, blind curves, no lanes, no markup. And the, the stipulation was you have to drive relatively fast. I think you have, you'd have to complete a whole race in less than 10 hours. And uh, you, it, had, it had to be fully automatic. So, you know, the, the researchers or the creators of the car just push the button, it drives off, and then vanishes. At the end, you just see if it finishes or, or not. Uh, and, uh, uh, well, let me tell you right from the start. So this first race was a failure. None of the cars made it. The, the, the best car was the, the car from Carnegie Mellon University, and they made like eight miles, and then they uh, caught a wheel in the ditch somewhere and they started burning rubber basically um, so that was a failure but then the next the, the next year the price doubled oh did I mention there was a price it was a million bucks uh, the, so I think the next year was two million and so the next year the, they learned from their mistakes and uh, actually a few cars got to the finish and IU was uh, also uh, Qualifying the car, so we qualified, but we didn't get any anywhere in the race, as I understand. So didn't qualify. Yeah, didn't go far. And uh, just they followed up with a, in 2007. They followed up with an urban challenge, which was you know kind of getting it more real. They built up some mock city in a military installation somewhere, and had cars driving with actual traffic and road signs, and uh, that was also a successful event. Let me just show you some pictures here. So this is how the race looked, the first one, the first two ones actually. And this is what we had. Can I ask you a question? Sorry. Sure. So with the Derby Challenge in 2005, was that it? So somebody got the money or did they keep doing it after that? Or did they think we've done our job? Yeah, they stopped. For, for their purposes, you know, the race was a success and uh, 
my understanding is, well, I'm going to talk about okay. the teams that, that won, and actually the team from Stanford ended up winning the race, and then they got uh, into developing the car on their own. I'm not sure if there was any military involvement after that. But basically, the military, what, what they wanted to do is some, some you know, dangerous places like, let's say you, have, you are in Iraq, and you want to deliver some goods, the drivers are getting killed, so the idea is that if you have an autonomous vehicle delivering those things, then it saves lives, and uh, so that was their goal. But from from the technical standpoint, that that's what we had to deal with, right? And uh, I was uh, 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 my my area is computer vision, so I had to basically look at the images and sort of uh, infer what we can from from those images. As you can see, it's much trickier than just sort of a straight lane with the with the markings on the road. There are some. Uh, Rocks, you can see there are some mountain overpasses, and uh, it's just really a tough, tough road. And uh, a lot of teams had trouble. I have just this little amusing little clip that I made of some of the some of the contestants that were there. So this one guy from I think it was from Berkeley, if I'm not mistaken. He he had a motor motorcycle, and you know, <laughs> well, watch what it does now. Uh, oh. <laughs> a little like lag on each side that was uh, basically training wheels that would uh, unfold and help it lift and uh, even with those it didn't get too far. Now that, that's a big, that was a big military contractor and you know their approach was much more massive but that's the qualifying course by the way. You have to go through this in order to do the real but it just couldn't go through this. I think they tried eight times, and you can see this guy kind of praying. <laughs> I think they got through this on the, on the on the last attempt, but again, didn't didn't end too far in the race. Yeah, and those little snippets that I took, by the way, at the end there's going to be a slide. I'm sure the organizers will post it somewhere, so you can go to. Uh, there's a Nova documentary about this, or you can watch it. Nice. Uh, yeah, there was one more. This one was crazy. Uh, so basically, this uh, just ran haywire and slammed it. <laughs> <laughs> kind of gives you an illustration of, you know, there are serious people, sometimes it's uh, a lot of funding and they work for a year or two and uh, it's still a difficult problem. What you are dealing with is basically, you're trying to find where the car is in the space. Uh, well, they provided the GPS coordinates, sort of like, uh, you know, Google Maps, driving directions. They, they tell you where you need to go and every 100 yards they drop you like a breadcrumb of, of uh, of the location, next location you have to get to, but in between those, it's completely, you're completely on your own, and uh, so you have to know where you are, how the car is orient, oriented in the road, if there's anything else, how best to, uh, to bypass a curve or bypass a boulder, uh, how to control the speed, the steering, uh, and you can imagine that if you're in a city, there's also pedestrians, bicyclists, yes. So Google didn't have their car in this race? No, there was no Google at that point. And, I mean, there was Google, but yeah, yeah Google didn't. Uh, they joined a little bit later, and I'm going to talk quite a, quite a bit about them, because this is one of the heaviest tested projects so far. Uh, so yeah, if, if you were... Excited about Google? I'm going to talk a lot about. <laughs> so, uh, just just a kind of brief couple slides about the sensors that the cars use. And this is, by the way, the car that uh, Indy Robotics Racing Team had had, a, had an, in the race. As you can see, there's a lot of equipment mounted on top. And for for a lot of the cars, this equipment was very similar. And I, I sort of took it off the web and listed some of the things that that people use. So let me just start from the bottom, I guess. The GPS is it's obvious, right? There are a couple of GPS units on the on the rooftop. You have to know your GPS coordinates. Uh, the the most important perhaps are these two. 
on top. So these, these give, give the car its vision. Uh, well, cameras are just, uh, could be regular cameras or could be stereo cameras, where you have two cameras, sort of like left and right eye, and they not only let you see the picture, but they also give you a little bit of a depth resolution, so you can tell how far things are. Uh, now, lighter on top is the, I think it's the most crucial component that all of the cars use. Uh, and the way it works, it's basically, it's a laser range meter. It's, it's like a laser pointer that spins very fast and it measures, for, for each point it reflects from, it measures how far this point is from the car. And now you have a whole bunch of those pointers. You can reconstruct a 3D map of the terrain and also of the other cars on the road. So this is the, the critical component and it's the most expensive actually. Um, on the order of about $100,000 right now. Uh, there are also wheel sensors that, let's say the car gets into a tunnel and you don't have GPS, you don't know where you are. There are inertial sensors and wheel sensors and accelerometers that help uh, uh, to deduce by, uh, from how you move and how you accelerate to deduce where you are right now. So if you're getting in a tunnel, you can navigate without GPS for some time. And there are also radars. Uh, there are radars sometimes mounted on, on, on the front of the car to see if there's anything in front, the side, sometimes even on the back. But the radars just tell you if there's any obstacles in, uh, obstacle in front, in front of the car. Um, all right, good. Uh, yeah, lighter, I mentioned, is the most uh, critical component here. So this is how one of those looks. And, I looked it up, this, this unit in particular, and this is the one that Google Car is using. It's sold commercially for about $70,000. Uh, it, it, well, there are some technical specs, but basically what you get out of it is you, you can reconstruct the... You see this little picture on the right? You can reconstruct... Every red line is a one laser pointer looking, uh, and you can tell where the objects are in the world. Uh, the problem with the lighter though, uh, oh, I have another here. So this is a car driving and you can see whatever lights up in red and green is what the lighter is getting. And the, the blue is estimated drivable surface. So the car has to determine what's the safe path, you know, where, where there is a rock, where there is an obstacle. Uh, and this is done with lighter. This is another video of the, the car that actually won the race. So you can see it's driving. Now let me just pause it for a sec. Um, so basically, lighter is good, but you know those beams, they have certain resolution, and the closer to the car, the better the resolution. Because you can imagine, as you kind of lifting it up and further away, the distance between the beams becomes greater and greater for the same angle. So usually within uh, 30 to 50 feet you start losing resolution and you no longer can tell if there's a bump this big or this big so basically you have a large large error. And so what the winning team, and I think this is pretty cool, what they did is um, they used lighter in combination with the cameras to expand this. So what they did is the lighter tells us that this is drivable, this is good, there is no bumps here. But it, it's not so sure about this part. Okay, so, uh, and there are also cameras. Cameras are good because they can see further away, but it's kind of hard just from the camera to tell, let's say, by the color of the road if it's drivable. So what they did is they took this part and took the color from here, because we know this is drivable from the lighter. And they extrapolated it here and tried, tried to find the same color further away. Does it make sense? So, so you, you take a color histogram here and uh, uh, run an algorithm that looks for a similar color distribution. So you isn't, find that, it. isn't that cheating? Uh, <laughs> I think it's actually pretty fair. Well, the okay, other guys did the cheating. I mean, but so, but were there, I thought the idea was there was all off-road. It is, yeah. But well, so... so, so uh, it, it can find any color, right? So if it's a gravel, uh, once again, so lighter tells us there are no bumps here. And uh, the thinking here is, is as follows. It, it says, 
Okay, if there are no bumps, let me assume that this is good. Let me find for similar colors. So let's say if you're driving on grass, you assume that green is good. You extrapolate and you say everything green further away is good. And it updates, uh, let's say, 10 times a second. So, you know, every few, let's say, every couple feet further away, you keep updating. So it's actually pretty smart. And uh, I'm going to mention the next couple slides that the other guys did what I think was cheating. <laughs> but, <laughs> yes. This works fine on a level terrain, but what if you're cresting a little hill or going up and down? You're just suddenly it loses sight completely of the terrain. Yeah, it's well, pointing up, right? I mean, yeah, that, that, that's a that's a fair point. So, 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 what you're saying is, if if we, uh, I can just see all the way to the horizon, then I can extrapolate. Right, yeah. Well, if you're going up the hill, you have to apply heuristics like slow down, slow down. or uh, and the the reason they added this visual camera stuff to the lighter is to drive faster. They actually tested just with the lighter and they could go about to up to 20 miles per hour. But they figured in order to complete the course in time they had to drive a little bit faster. So they came up with this uh, uh, kind of fusion algorithm that, that utilizes both sensors. And, uh, and, and with that they were able to drive just a little bit faster. This is the way they, they were able to come first. All right, so just just to continue the demos, and you can see uh, in the links uh, there are some videos that show how they drive over different terrains, not just not not just in uh, paved road. Yeah. So it fills with red everything that it thinks it's drivable. And we've actually been trying. I know I was trying to to do just from the camera, and, and you know you try to. Uh, to different uh, computer vision techniques to find the road. It's really a challenging task if you're just using one sensor. Yeah? So say an angle of jumped out in front of the car, would the response time be faster than a human being? It, it would, yeah. From what I read, uh, so, so it, it would use, in this case, it would use a radar for collision detection. And, uh, so the lighter, as you've seen on the slide, it's 5 to 15 hertz. I'm not sure what's the frequency for the radar, but it's probably like 10, 20 times a second. And so uh, you have, well, what about 50 milliseconds of delay there? You have whatever whatever time it takes for the computer to com compute in, and you know the decision and then hit the brakes. So I would say, yeah, from for, from what I've been reading, is it's really fast and it's much faster. And in fact, there, there are some uh, examples that I'm going to show that show real driving situation and how it stops in front of a pedestrian. Uh, so let's see. Yeah, the camera that we used uh, looked like this. It was a stereo camera and uh, uh, did play a little bit with that. So I mentioned that the camera allows you to uh, extrapolate the road. It allows you to detect and classify obstacles. So, so the radar can just tell you there's something in, in front of you, it's time to stop, but you also want to know, let's say, if there is a traffic sign, what kind of sign it is, if it's a vehicle, if it's a bicycle. So you, so you need vision to do that. You need computer vision. Yes? So is there a different quality between um, nighttime and daytime and visibility that these autonomous cars have? Uh, yeah. I think uh, the Google car that I'm going to talk a little bit about later, they, they claim they, they have the capability of driving at night. I'm suspecting this is a combination of using the lighter, which does not require light, the radars, and probably they use an infrared camera. I think for the DARPA race it was known that it would start in the morning, it would go for the next, I don't know, 10 hours or so, and so uh, Night was not such. I, th I think the blight, blinding s sunlight was a bigger problem than the than the darkness. Yeah, I see another question there. Mm -hmm. What happens when a shadow falls across the road or something that changes the color and all the effects? So very, very interesting question. I, I actually wrote a paper on shadows, and uh, <laughs> you can mi mi mitigate that with uh, combining a regular uh, camera with an infrared camera. Not the expensive thermal kind, but just the regular, like near infrared camera. And uh, uh, well, I remember I, I was experimenting with that, and I saw that the infrared camera can remove the cloud cover from the 
So you know when the clouds are kind of running up over the ground, you see the color changes. So if you just look simply at the color histogram, it would appear very different. But uh, the infrared helps. Well, of course, you can also use some kind of heuristic to. Uh, y yes. Oh, uh, I was going to add on to there. Uh, what about uh, standing model? Uh, standing model, or uh, perhaps no or no? some other Indian condition that's going to. Yeah, and uh, uh, just 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 off the bat, uh, don't think I, I have a, every answer here. <laughs> Those are all challenging situations. I've seen cars driving all over the the puddles, and uh, uh, yeah. So so the problem there is what you see is not actually does not correspond to where your car is gonna be. Right, you're gonna be underwater. Well, Steve, do you remember what what happened with the puddles at all? Well, I remember. Yeah. Uh, uh, it was it was. It was one of the pathological uh, pictures that DARPA distribute to show the kind of situations. And, and uh, none of these things uh, work in isolation. And you, uh, the most important uh, feature you have on these cars is emergency stop. So <laughs> if it gets confused, it's going to stop. Oh, well, that's very encouraging for the, for the future. And. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and the, the reason I'm describing the sensors uh, in those last three, four slides is sort of to give you an idea that these are the car's eyes and ears, so so the more intelligent they are, well, there's also the brain, which is kind of hidden in the trunk, a bunch of computers, but, uh, you know, the better senses are, the better the car will be able to deal with uh, certain situations, just like humans are using all their senses and combining them together. Um, Yeah. Yeah, one other comment about the LiDAR. Um, I would think, since it depends on backscatter of laser, if you have very reflective surfaces, mm -hmm. then you can be in trouble because there's very little backscatter and you don't see the signal that you're turning. Oh, I see what saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a road might get away with a water on it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're looking at a hole in the ground. I mean, you're really looking at... It looks like it's either far away. What you see is not where you see it. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the point is that the light will just bounce off and reflect, and none of it will come back. And so, uh, using glider can be problematic. I, I haven't uh, dived into the details of how those commercial lighters work. I mean, yeah. I'm sure they have some mechanism to at least mitigate those effects. Right. Uh, so you can, am you can ambush these vehicles by putting a big mirror across the road. That's right. <laughs> Right, well at least it would stop, right? Or <laughs> it would realize that the you know the radar will tell it that there is a, an object and so uh Why would ambush a real car that way too? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well this is just some some stuff we were playing with. I shot a video, mounted two cameras on my car and ran around the some quarries here. And the left and the right are just slightly different, so whenever you look at the similar uh, pixels and their displacement, you can tell, you know, this dot is here in one image, but it's a little bit to the right in the other image. And so from that you can uh, tell very approximately how far this is. Well, it turns out the lighters work much better, but uh, at least this is in principle how it's done with the stereo cameras. Uh, let's see. And uh, another thing, when <laughs> she was smiling, so a couple colleagues and I did this. Uh, so this is the a scene from the actual DARPA challenge, and we, we tried to detect the road, kind of the outlines of the road and the horizon. And uh, the middle line is just the median. So you, you should stick to, to the median and don't don't veer too far away. Um, well, uh, back, coming back to the uh, winning teams, I, I mentioned that Stanford won, won the race, but uh, there was a, a contender, Car Carnegie Mellon had a huge team, and they had uh, two vehicles the second year, and they had a uh, help of about 20 PhD students, PhD master's students, and so what they did, and I have this real footage, so the organizers gave them coordinates two hours before the race started. It was like 4 a.m. 
And so what they did is they had this bunker. And basically, every student got a little piece of the road. <laughs> and then they had it ha manually adjusted the trajectories and they marked the speed with which the vehicle should travel every location. So if it's a dangerous... I'll see what right here. So I think that's cheating. And, and uh, I mean, uh, it's a great computer vision uh, 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 lab there, and uh, they do some cool stuff. But in this particular case, their approach was that you know we should just play it safe. Uh, of course, such a, such an approach would not work for a commercial car. You wouldn't be able to manually map, but they really wanted to win the race. But it could be incorporated into a G GPS information. If you had an autonomous car that was being fed GPS information, right. it could be, uh, there's a curve coming up. And yeah. yeah. So, so in this case, you're really relying on the accuracy of the GPS provider. Or let's say you have a, a navigation app in your car, and sometimes they're good, but we know sometimes they make mistakes there. So I guess what they were trying to test here, they could have given them those breadcrumbs with a greater frequency. Right, every like few meters or so, but instead they 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 preferred just like every hundred yards because they wanted to test how the car navigates in case it's an accurate. And uh, I, I guess you've all heard funny stories of people driving off bridges because they followed the GPS and uh, something was wrong on the map. And so uh, these guys had two vehicles. One was uh, adjusted so that it runs a little bit faster, a little bit riskier. And this vehicle was ahead of everybody else for, for a while, but then actually Stanford bypassed it. I think it's a lucky coincidence. They had some, some engine problem or something. But, but still, I mean, it's a, it's a good sort of uh, uh, punishment for, for cheating. <laughs> And uh, so this is the guy you saw just a glimpse who was behind the car in Stanford. And uh, there's a stereo camera there, uh, some, some sensors on top of the car. They work with Volkswagen. Uh, and it just shows you as the car drives, it reconstructs the road. Later on, uh, and uh, his name is Sebastian Thron. He's a really big name now, and uh, perhaps you've heard of him. But he later on joined uh, Google's team and worked on their autonomous car, I think. And he started in 2006. And uh, later on, Google's been uh, really just one of the most massive uh, efforts in this area. They, they right now have a fleet of about... Uh, 10 cars, there are some Priuses, I, well, well some, some cars, I don't remember the models, but they have about 10, 10 self-driving cars, and you've probably seen in the news, they've been testing them in uh, California, Nevada, uh, they have about 300,000 miles now combined of driving. Uh, and uh, the claim is that using their technology within the next five years, we can see some commercialization of this. Uh, I just pointed out some, some, again, some visual tests, some visual problems that the car has to face. Find the road, find where the car is on the road, find the obstacles, the pedestrians, bicyclists, and find uh, and recognize the traffic signs. Just, there's, one algorithm that does the sign recognition. So you have to find the sign in the image first. And second of all, you have to uh, go through the library and determine what sign it is, what does it say, and then accordingly do, some, do something with that information. And this is actually one of the latest demos. This is the Google car driving. As you can see, it detects obstacles, it detects the navigable path. It, uh, you probably saw the, the cyclist test. So, so this is a fully functioning, functioning work version of today's car that drives in urban, urban environments. Uh, and uh, the, the, there are some uh, 
again, if, if you follow this or go to links, there are some pretty impressive examples where uh, the car makes a left turn and there are a couple pedestrians crossing, <coughs> the car stops and waits until they finish their crossing. And uh, uh, they claim they haven't had any single accident while the car was driving in those 300,000 miles. There was an accident while the human being was driving. So, so, the, so they had to switch uh, operators, you know, they had like two hours max and then somebody else drives the car. Because you, you, you constantly have to sit and you don't touch the wheel, you don't touch the pedals, but you, you have to be ready to at any moment. So you can always override it by just doing any of those actions. Uh, and I think uh, sort of uh, c converging into more uh, of a social implications, legal things, uh, you know, one interesting thought is that a lot of people I, I, I hear and read saying that, well, how is it going to happen? I mean, are they just going to start selling the cars one day uh, and one day everybody's just going to drive self-driving cars? And I think uh, there are a lot of things we've seen in technology that are uh, good examples of this, like the, the what I have is a wash, washer and dryer, you know, people didn't just, uh, like, wash their clothes by hand and then one day there was this fully automated washer and dryer. Well first there was a drum that you had to spin and then there was just a washer that kind of didn't rinse maybe and you had to hang your things with the cloth pins and then eventually people have those fully automated devices that uh, do, well they're not, not fully automated, they, they still could fold things for you, that would be, that would be nice. <laughs> And, and there are some people in robotics, I've seen some videos they are working on, it's, it's a completely, totally insane challenging problem to fold, fold things. It's, you know, not bed sheets, just shorts, it's very difficult. Uh, and uh, I think this is the way it's going to happen with cars. We actually have seen, are seeing some automation slowly creeping in, you know, not from Google's, but from the regular car companies. So we've been, for, for years, of driving automatic transmission, right, and for all intents and purposes this is replacing a human hand and cruise control, many of you enjoy probably or not. Uh, uh, and the, well, the lower part, part is kind of the features that are coming up, some models already have them, but these are more advanced automation features. So there is driverless parking, the parking assist. Uh, Right, so you, you push the button and the car parallel parks for you, uh, and that's that's really a big help for a lot of us. Uh, the lane assist, it beeps or signals in any other way whenever you, uh, you know, drift away from your designated lane. There is traffic sign recognition, I've seen uh, in one car company, so it basically displays on your panel whatever the signs are. If you, in case if you miss the speed limit, it can tell you that, and so on. Blind spot. Yeah. Sorry. So how vulnerable would that be, that the recognition to to sabotage? Like, like if somebody spray painted over a stop sign, is it is it going to is that foolproof or? Mm. Uh, no, I think it, and it raises an interesting issue. And perhaps we should talk about it more. You know, nothing is hundred percent foolproof, and. Uh, nor is the human body and or human vision. So the question, I guess, is can we make it good enough so that uh, it's, you know, it's being sabotaged rarely or very difficult to sabotage it? And then, then there's another concern. Once you start talking about economies of scale, what if something's sabotaged on the system level? Like what if the operating system gets hacked? and all the cars all of a sudden start hitting pedestrians. So, you know, we, we had just one crazy person, now we have a crazy fleet of cars. And then, if there's any wireless signal going on, it could be done remote, remotely. Uh, you can access the computer for the car, change some code. Uh, I, I think it's a very big problem. Uh, no, no answer from me, I think, you know, control and supervision from government agencies that would help probably the Road Transportation Safety Administration. Uh, anybody? Yeah. Well, uh, gentleman here, you have a question. So what about liability once a car starts recognizing some signs and gets it wrong? Did you 
say liability? Yeah. Right, I think that's what I have posed in the next slide. So, uh, so the liability is the, the issue of who's, who's liable for, for a certain accident, right? That, uh, uh, yeah, and, and there's been a lot of talk about this uh, since I, I heard some legal experts say that uh, in this case the personal liability would not apply because there's no human operating it, so it would be more like a, a malfunction of, of the of the uh, uh, machine, and that would fall under the I forget the exact name, but basically the company would have to deal with that. And I think potentially, you know, let's say big companies like Google and some car manufacturers get together with the insurance companies. Once they are able to demonstrate that the amount of accidents you know, per mile, per 100,000 miles, is much lower than human drivers, the insurance companies would be really eager to you know, get on board and have some kind of special insurance that completely absolves the the human being from responsibility and it's dealt with by by the by the manufacturer of the car and manufacturer of the, of the software the system. Uh, yeah. How did Google handle that with its current city driving car? Uh, you mean legal issues? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they, they, you probably seen they passed a couple laws. So right now, uh, three states have uh, autonomous cars legal on the roads. This is uh, Nevada was first. Uh, Florida and third California. So, the from what I read, the law says that they are legal on the roads as long as there is a driver sitting at the driver's seat ready to intervene. And I think at least in Nevada, they also require a second person at the passenger seat, just as a backup, I guess, to, to maybe grab the wheel. <laughs> but. Uh, those, those laws at least allow them to test it out and uh, accumulate some statistics. Yes? Well, the problem with liability through insurance is that, at least with the automotive insurance, uh, it's, it's relatively, relatively simple to, uh, to I guess, uh, get somewhat of a constant, kind of a constant rate of accidents per driver or something like that for time. Yeah. And then yeah, it's, not, it's more or less predictable, you can add in factors such as the weather. The problem with the automated uh, driving system is that uh, you're going to have, uh, if you have something like a software error or I like, guess some sort of malicious action that can happen to the system, you're going to have these large peaks of, I guess, accidents and liability. And uh, the thing about insurance companies is uh, they tend to go right. to Kind of like uh, the whole hurricane in front of you. You try to see what comes in. <laughs> yeah, I, I see a point. So, so the, the insurance company wouldn't be able to withstand a large uh, swarm of claims if, if somebody hacks the software. Yes? Well, if there's anything more frightening than the prospect of having software, having your life in the hands of software, it's uh, getting in the car and, and uh, seeing the flight flash that if you want to do your upgrade today. But that's what's going to happen. And, and um, I kind of dispute the idea that the uh, accident rate will be unpredictable because uh, uh, the uh, uh, in aviation, they uh, have fairly rigorous uh, methods that are required to develop safety critical software. And that's a practice that's been going on for 30 or 40 years. The uh, automobile industry does have to catch up, but I think they'll follow the same practices. And uh, then the, the question I always ask is how safe do they have to be? I mean, if we're willing to tolerate a quarter of a million injuries and 35,000 deaths a year, that's setting pretty low standards for, for uh, how good this guy will be. But design error is the key legal issue. And I'm sure the legal profession is licking its chops, just as it did with uh, you know, the accelerator problem and you know, whatever. And Boeing batteries. And, and, and Boeing batteries. Uh, they're going to jump at every opportunity to force companies to prove that they follow due diligence in their design. And, and that's going to be a major yeah. problem. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, of 
course, the aviation is much uh, tighter regulated, and uh, as, as a car, more than a car industry, but uh, yeah, I, I honestly don't know. But uh, you know, what, one of the points is that uh, actually, uh, since you brought up aviation, you probably <coughs> know that a lot of most of the races are, are on autopilot nowadays. Uh, and uh, it actually leads to another problem that the pilots are getting out of shape <laughs> and so, so they're getting sloppy because they use autopilot all the time and that, that's sort of a big problem if you're you know you're just sitting there just in case and one day you need to drive somewhere and you don't know how uh, but, but in, another argument is yes so uh, uh, automation we've seen is in aviation and you know not fully automated, but uh, NASA is landing things on Mars and other places. So how, how difficult could it be to make a car? Well, it, it is, turns out, difficult, but still, I mean, you can see that it's realistic. Um, and I, I, uh, some, yes? Oh, sorry, one more question. So, so what, because before you cited a, a statistic, 300,000 miles, no accidents. But was that, so that was, there was a driver there. Was that without intervention? Yeah, that was, so I think, and again, that's sort of me relying that Google's being honest, because I haven't checked any books, uh, but uh, I think 300,000 is the pure autonomous driving time. So whatever the you know people parking the car or handovers between the drivers, they didn't count that in the number. And so they didn't count like the the path with the, the, the human intervening at the last minute to prevent you know, running over some grandmother. That, that's not yeah. Good. Google so, claims that the 300,000 was purely Okay. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, I'm just taking it from their words, but they say that there was no net, it was not necessary to intervene at the last moment. Well, uh, whether it's true or not, uh, we, we, we'll find out. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure they need to do more testing, and, and actually this is kind of winding down, and we can talk about this, but I did some... I was trying to find the numbers for the, okay, so how many crashes per mile does an average human being get? And uh, uh, statistics are almost always concentrated on fatal incidents. But I found uh, the total number of uh, accidents in the US is 6 million. And the total number of uh, miles traveled in the US is uh, about three trillion. <coughs> so if you did it up, if my math is correct, it's about one accident per uh, 500,000 miles. So obviously, you know, whatever Google's showing is still not enough to come to any conclusion. Once they get a few million, then we can start talking about this. Uh, uh, let's see. Well, another, another interesting, uh, actually two interesting implications that we haven't touched is uh, there is a lot of talk about if, if the cars are driving themselves, can you just, uh, uh, well, do you need a car? Do you need to keep it in your garage? There is statistics that shows, you know, 90% of the time they're not utilized. They're either in the garage or in the garage at work or in the parking lot. So, you know, for a town like Bloomington, for example, you can think of just clearing up a lot of space if you have a fleet of self-driving cars and you pull up a smartphone and just summon it up uh, and then leave it whenever and uh, it will go to its next owner or to its next user. Uh, so that's, that's one thing people see as a good uh, outcome. Of course, then you, you get all sorts of uh, issues that you get with uh, taxis, I guess, uh, you know, the hygiene, well, you don't know who's been there, what they were doing, so, so you'd probably want to still own, own the car, <laughs> just in case. Uh, and the, one more thing is uh, the, the road utilization, you know, a huge portion of the highways and the roads are, if you look at them kind of from airplane, they're empty, because people just, you know, leave too much space, you get this accordion effect, so human drivers are not as precise. If you can have cars just follow like within 10 feet of one another, ideally. Uh, so if, in other words, if all the cars or most of the cars are automated, you can maximize the 
utilization, and that's a big benefit because the highways are very expensive, and so you know these Google cars are right now probably half a million if they start selling them today. But well, that, that could be nothing compared to the trillions you need to invest in the, in the highway infrastructure and expansion. Actually, I have a little. You've seen this cool demo how the cars, autonomous cars. <laughs> So these are little robots, you know, simulator robots that navigate through the intersection. And it's probably crazy, right? So you, 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 if you're going through this, you need to close your eyes. <laughs> Thank you for slowing me down. Look at question. If this level would be well, the, the, so the car, <laughs> Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Well, the question was, uh, the cars, uh, are they going to be communicating with another, or is it completely independent? The car just sees everything around it. And most of the things I talked about today are completely autonomous. So there is no, uh, the DARPA project and the Google car, it's just a self-contained thing. So it, it knows its environment but it doesn't talk to any other cars. There's been a number of projects uh, in, uh, in the world, actually there's been one in Germany and one, uh, at least one in the US, where people working on uh, uh, caravans. So you have, uh, let's say, a bunch of trucks on the road, and only the first truck is a driver. All the rest of them are just kind of tagging along, keeping the distance and they change lane with the first one. So, so basically it's like a truck train. The first driver controls the rest of them. And you know, the other ones can still have a driver who's asleep, for example. You know, this way they can take turns. And you can imagine just the regular passenger cars joining in, into this uh, caravan. There's been a lot of uh, research on buses too. So, so the public transportation, if you, if you can have autonomous bus, and you know it's it's easier because it's uh, you can constrain it. There's a bus lane. It's, it's it's very simple. You always stick to the curb kind of thing. I'm trying to think, I've seen I think uh, Heathrow Airport in London uses now you know like those monorail uh, trains between terminals. So they they have an actual bus that goes on the road with a thick line painted so it follows the line and makes stops. But otherwise, it's completely autonomous, so it, it doesn't have a driver. Yeah? I have a few more questions. Has there been any sort of uh, large scale design or implementation of uh, the actual infrastructure that is autonomous vehicles can use? Where it's such as like a giant line following, okay, instead of trying to negotiate just a, a normal human driven urban environment? Uh, so, so you're saying, let's say, if there is a caravan. And I want to squeeze through and make my exit. Okay. Uh, well, it's more of instead of driving on the roads that you've constructed, could you make special roads that would load the bar of the auto automation yeah. necessary in the vehicle to? Yeah, and I think uh, you know the early and there was a lot of uh, uh, actually I, I started from 2004, but if you kind of dig, dig uh, further in the history, you will see that there were a lot of attempts of automation. And before, a lot of them involved some kind of new infrastructure. So, you know, you have special lights, special sensors that the cars talk to, and this way the car itself doesn't have to be that intelligent. Uh, uh, well, uh, I think they did it not because they wanted to, because that's, that was the only way to do it, let's say in the 80s, because there, there were no... Uh, sensors that we have now but uh, you know in reality you, you still need to deal with other things like pedestrians jumping up so you cannot control everything so, so you would still end up having all those sensors for other things and then the question becomes I guess uh, do you need to invest the billions into the new road if you can do it without it uh, yeah
Yeah, I think that it's a huge concern. Uh, but in response to that, like, when do you think that instead of paying for a bus driver, when do you pay for a person who is a professional at security then? Uh, you want but what they every bus. Yeah. 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 But if you're a bus company, you're going to want to pay some guy to sit around there and see it. But instead of paying for a bus driver, you just pay for a security person. We already so paid for a bus driver. Yes. Yes. For, for whom? She's going to have some plans. Oh, that's right. Okay, for them. Yeah. The light rail system, the right crew, they don't have a good survival rate for the light rail system, but they do have security guards controlling everything, showing up on random train cars with no times. Yeah, well, that's a good question, but maybe they, they shouldn't be called drivers then. I mean, uh, so if their primary responsibility becomes uh, not driving the vehicle, but instead, you know, attending, like, let's say, helping people. Uh, Disabled people to get, you know, to fasten the belts, uh, helping people if something happens. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I can I can see that, but at the same time, there is a huge uh, uh, burden and risk, you know, from a human driver falling asleep, and uh, that's the risk we're taking because you know people need to get places and uh, get to their work. Yeah. I'm just curious, do any of these um, programs for any of these autonomous vehicles quite projected? Yeah, I'm not. You go ahead. Well, uh, in artificial intelligence research, that's quite often how you, where you try to evolve the intelligence. Right? That's usually how that's approached. You have a, a model of what you think is happening, and compare that with what's really happening, and that feeds back to adjust what the decision All right. process is. Yeah. But that's part of the, uh, not, not part of the runtime, it's part of the design. So it's all yeah. yeah, there are actually, I just wanted to add that there are, of course, there are a few machine learning techniques that were used in the examples that I've shown. For example, the, the Google car that I showed with the extrapolation of the road, they, they actually had a, they had to use supervised learning to uh, uh, train the algorithm. And so, so the way they did it is they actually drove the, the road and recorded the data. And it doesn't mean it's going to work on this road only. It means that you know once it's once it is trained, it's going to work the best on this road. <clears throat> but if the algorithm is flexible enough, it should also uh, general generalize to to other conditions. Yeah. Um, another concern, and this is also true for alternative uh, energy cars, is that uh, when they start, when they're relatively new and introduced, you might have more problems with the automated you may have uh, more stuff, you may have issues with software updates, or even, I mean, frankly, you're probably going to have a, a greater risk of accidents early on in the system. Are these issues going to turn people off so you can't build that economy of scale to really expand it or something like this? That a, uh, Anybody wants to take that? Well, it, whenever you bring this up, people find it unimaginable. And, uh, but except now it's starting to get enough uh, airplay that people are going, maybe it's imaginable. Um, uh, I forgot what my point was. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's a discussion, so yeah, anybody can jump in. Uh, didn't they ask this, those same questions when oh, I know. motor cars replace horses? Sure. Usually, yeah. Whenever the new technology comes, there is always a concern. Yeah. Well, motor cars, I mean, obviously. Well, I mean, even with the motor cars, that they have steam powered carriages, and they are heavily restricted and regulated them for something like 80 to 100 years before they kind of came up with the modern. 
Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think one of the key issues that was on Alex's second or third slide was you are already driving a vehicle that is almost autonomous. That's right. You know, it's handling a lot of decision making for you. It's just that allowing you to actually do the control, but, but all of the decision making for, uh, you know, uh, stability control, brake control, cruise control. So you are slowly giving uh, uh, an order of, of, of this automation. And so I think it's going to evolve and just gradually get put together with fancy and fancy features until one day they'll say, well, if you want to steer, go ahead. <laughs> the need for you know, checking messages and something has to accommodate to those needs as well and uh, actually I think uh, in Nevada Google lobbied uh, once they got this autonomous law passed they lobbied also for the exemption from the texting ban well they didn't get that but the, the idea is that you know why would you ban texting is uh, if if there's nobody at the wheel, so to speak. But yeah, I think, you know, one of the reasons is uh, this is so compelling to me is that humans are notoriously bad. And if you, if you listen to some of the talks of Sebastian Thrun, he's talking a lot about how many people are getting killed by cars. And, uh, you know, after watching a lot, a lot of those videos when I drive home and just notice what I do that's stupid or distracted, and also other people, of course, because I'm better. Obviously, that's what everybody thinks that you know I'm a I'm a better driver. Uh, yeah. Um, if according to Google, in five years or so, our cars are going to start driving for us, how many years before our cars will start texting for us? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I can I can see that happening. <laughs> but well, they'll be looking for a parking place where you're 100 miles from your destination. But actually, there's there's a service just to follow up on that. There's a service that's offering to uh, right. to text after you die, based on uh, your texting. I don't know if this is a joke or not, but is that well, based on your texting patterns? Yeah, yeah probably the, the computer scientists know that there's been this ongoing challenge, the Turing test challenge, where there are chat bots, the the, the programs that are trying to uh, chat in such a way that the the human on the other end would think that this is a human and. Uh, there's been some some progress in that field made, <laughs> and uh, uh, I think the competition is held annually, and uh, uh, s s a lot of the human judges are getting fooled by. It. I think we're going off topic a little bit. Yes. I think I mean it must be easier to do this on water than on than on land, and even easier in the air. So, what about what about those boats and airplanes? I mean, right now, I mean, the, I mean, the airplanes personal, are, right? Personal airplanes, you know, this, oh. is, this is popular science, you know, but, but it, must, it must be a much simpler problem for an airplane or a helicopter than it is for a car. 
Yeah, well, the commercial airplanes, they already do it pretty much. Yeah. So my understanding is that even the landing and takeoff is, is right. done by the autopilot. So, uh, yeah. uh, and uh, if you're talking about uh, uh, flying cars, yeah, yeah. well, uh, I, I think that there are other problems there, right? I, I've seen there are a few companies that are trying to uh, release uh, those things and they are for sale. But, well, it's costly. Fuel is a concern, and then you still need need to get approved by FAA. So you need to have a pilot's license, and you have to go to a strip. So it's not like you can just take off from your drive, uh, you know, drive. I know, but the, but the basic point is you're not constrained to these lanes of high traffic. You have, yeah. You now open up in three dimensions, and so there's it's. Sparser, yeah. sparser travel and fewer obstacles. Right? So. Yeah, so, so uh, as for the air, it would be nice. I think yeah. just there are other limitations right now. Uh, as for water, well, not everybody has water, so <laughs> <laughs> we don't have it here. Uh, y yes? So I, I was trying to think of what, what, where there might be an advantage for, for humans behind the wheel. <clears throat> when the, when the Google, uh, there was very interesting some Google um, images where it was defining cars. Defining cycles were really obvious, you know, boxes, whatnot. But if, and imagine like a, a child dashing across the street. I think a human would be very good at picking that out. It might be very difficult for for a machine to, to identify that. Not too uh, what do you think? No, it's uh, it's all dependent on the resolution of the sensor. In this case, the cars I showed you, they were able to detect bumps in the road on the road, uh, eight to twelve centimeters. So that's three inches, four inches. So the child would not be a problem and you know a dog would not be a problem a squirrel might be a problem but then it's you know it, 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 it is right now yes squirrels need to grow bigger or grow some long antennas Yeah. Uh, um, so, if you were to put this into a military context, and so I could see how it would be very beneficial in that situation, um, but what about the, the energy source that's used to drive these cars? Because if they're using fuel, <coughs> then wouldn't somebody or somebody need to go and refuel the... Uh, unless, you know, you're going to use, like, let's say, solar panels, you know, because um, to create energy, because they're going to be better off in the daytime anyways. Um, yeah, yeah. About that? Well, you know, honestly, I don't know, uh, but I, I, I would imagine that uh, they have some some contingency plan, plan for that. Let's say uh, uh, just a really big gas tank, and my guess is, you know, the military usually are... Like trailing with what? Well, if, if, if we're talking about one of those cars that we've seen in the video, that's yeah. a huge, huge uh, military vehicle. Uh, does anybody know what the, mile, the, what the range for those is? I, I mean, for, for the regular sedan, it's about 300,000 miles, but for... Not 300,000. 300. Well, what about for the military? Is it, is it bigger? I, I, I honestly don't know anything about the military vehicles. And, yeah. Uh, I was just going to say that uh, I believe drones are capable of literally killing uh, at this time. I guess it like, comes to like, military applications. But I'm guessing having a car refuel from some sort of automated station is definitely has to be uh, a lot easier. Yeah, well, the missions they designed them for, you know, like missions in the desert, not, not necessarily have a lot of those automated st stations. Yeah, uh, well, it wouldn't be any easier for humans to refuel a car in the desert. Yeah. Well, well, so solar is an option. You know, you know the limitations with solar panels and batteries. They're still not the capacity they can hold is not enough for long trips. And the solar panel that you can deploy on top of the cars is, again, you, yeah, you have to, well, I know of, of a... And what about clouds, you know, like if you're on a mission yeah. and it's like super important and the cloud goes Night. by, right? Yes, and, and uh, I know of a lawnmower that's automated and it has a solar panel, perhaps you've seen it, uh, it's 
very expensive, but it has a solar panel that basically mows your backyard and then parks outside in the sun. And in a week, it's ready to do it again. Uh, that, that's that's you know where it can go, but I don't know. Yes. Go ahead. Well. Um, it used to be popular when you built a robot indoors to give it the capability to look for electrical sockets. Remember where they are and then plug itself in and it's ready to blow on the charge. And, uh, that refueling is for domestic purposes non-issue. I mean, it, it's, uh, if you tell the uh, car the GPS coordinates of a refueling station, once it gets within 100 yards of that, it's going to be able to figure out how to plug itself in. I just like in the military context, I just think it's just a little, you know, iffy. You know, I think it'll be awesome if you would have an energy source that would be um, not compromised, you know. And then also, if obviously, if something was to happen, then obviously it'll blow itself up. And you know, not be like radioactive at the same time. Um, yeah, I was going to say plutonium, but. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, as long as the plutonium is large enough to. Well, but what if they sabotage not just one car but ten cars and then collect all the plutonium? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I was wondering about, so about the GPS because I, I don't know if this is still true, but I, I, I understand that in the past, for military reasons, <clears throat> the resolution of the GPS units was limited. And so if you're a military, you got a very fine resolution. Mm -hmm. If you're a civilian, you use the same system, but you get a, a yeah. lousier. Yeah, so what, what's the what's the situation there? Do would it, would it, a car that was built by Google, whatever, would they get the, the finer resolution, or, or can we narrow it down even better and can rely on it more? Or? Well, as far as I remember, for civilian purposes, it's about two, three feet resolution, uh, and for military, it's it's higher, I would say in order of magnitude higher. So so the cars that were driving in the challenge, they were using regular uh, grade GPS receivers. Uh, yeah, if they build it for the military, I, can, I guess they can use a higher. Well, there's but, also differential GPS. So, so somebody can put up a reference antenna and you can use that to refine your position. There you go. And so you can use a cell tower. Help you locate, but if you're within 10 feet, then the presumption is that your sensory, local sensory system is going to be able to. And also, know, in, in yeah. town, you're driving behind buildings and cut out GPS. And I think the point is, uh, GPS is good enough. There is no no point in, you know, one, once you get down to a few feet and you know roughly where you are, it all becomes a matter of what's what's around you. So. You, you know, you're not going to be still relying on GPS plus plus, <clears throat> excuse me, a map that somebody built for you to assume that what's there is there. So it's not just the GPS. GPS signal just tells you where you are on Earth. It doesn't tell you tell you where you are next to a building or where you are on the road. So, so that has to be coded by somebody, and uh, 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 that's why you know that's why you got to use those visual sensors to look in a kind of smaller scale. But so if, if everything had a GPS, right, and the SUV wasn't being blocked by, by buildings, then I mean, in principle, you could use that as basically because your neighboring car has its own GPS, and you can use that to figure out how far it is from you. You can use that system. Uh, yeah, if you had communication. <coughs> yeah, yeah. So you also would have to have a, a van Yeah, they'd have to have, to have a transmitter of some sort. Um, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I was just curious how powerful are the computers that are being used in the system right now? Is that a limitation? Uh, I don't think it's a big limitation. I, I recall Stanford, uh, so the question was how powerful are the computers that are used in the system. Uh, I, uh, Stanford, uh, the car that won the race, uh, they used uh, six Pentium processors, so it was a, a parallel computing system with six boxes kind of in the rack. All, all, all placed in the trunk. But you know that uh, it was 2005, so probably now you have in the phone the same, the same kind of power as roughly one of those computers. Uh, so that's not a big issue. Uh, I, I, yeah, as, as I mentioned, I think the most expensive component right now is this lighter. But I suspect uh, it can come down dramatically. Um, 
because just most of the price is them trying to recuperate the R&D expenses that they've spent on these units. I, I, well, as an example, right now at work we use uh, some eye tracking equipment that's fifty thousand dollars, and you can see that the components you, you can make it for maybe ten times less or fifty times less. It's just a matter of it has to be a, a large enough production to to lower the price. So how long is this going to take? Uh, you, you know, I'm not into predictions. I would rather it happen sooner. But as I said before, I don't think it's going to hap just happen. I think it's going to happen gradually. So, so, well, so the, the, the answer to your question, it is already happening. It is already happening. You can buy a car with uh, self-parking, with lane assist. Uh, and, uh, you know, big car manufacturers coming on board. Uh, I think Toyota had something at the CES uh, uh, this year. And uh, Ford's doing something with that. So, so it's not just you know the high tech Googles of the world. There, there's also people who, who whose core businesses, cars, are doing that as well. I, uh, so I would say you know you'll see more and more automation within the next five years, eventually leading to a totally autonomous car. Yes. Well, there's there's collision avoidance schemes in some cars you can buy right now. Do you know how they work? I think it's a radar. I've seen, I, I read about it, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a radar and basically once you get, you know, close enough to an obstacle and it sees that the speed differential is high, it just takes control away from you, it slams the brakes. And uh, th there is also intelligent cruise control that I mentioned, which basically, you know how you try to <clears throat> use your cruise control but the guy in front of you keeps like going a couple of miles faster, a couple of miles slower, so intelligent cruise control will handle that frustration for you. It will just, you know, keep keep within the range <coughs> of, of, of the speeds. Yeah? I was wondering, um, because I personally prefer motorcycles over cars, do you think it would be cheaper if it was if this would be employed in motorcycles more than cars? Uh, I think, uh, the, you know, the, the I mean, despite, like, you know, controlling for, you know, the, the price of a motorcycle and a car. Yeah, yeah, well, you've seen how a motorcycle did. Uh, I mean, and, and actually, and actually, this guy who, who invented the motorcycle, I think he's from Berkeley, but he just completely dropped out and worked on the motorcycle, and now he works with Google, too. So, <laughs> uh, uh, but the, the issue is that the cost of the sensors is going to be probably the same. So, you know, if you but then isn't it like less to a kilowatt? Well, never mind, that's never mind, sorry. And, and, and also, you know, you have to mount all those computers, mm -hmm. <coughs> probably the battery to run the computers. So, so it kind of gets bulky for the motorcycle, but who knows, eventually, yeah, maybe. No, I think you're right, I think it is quite comparable, I mean, it isn't. Yeah. Is it true that in these cars, the computer processing requirements are not a limit, a lot of limitation? Sort of, you can, any computer these days could Yeah, yeah, I, you know, uh, of course you can uh, fathom of a more complicated algorithm and uh, just clog any computer. But yeah, I think the, the basic stuff that they do, the, the computer vision algorithms, especially with the, you know, the, with the fast, we, we've seen a, a real explosion of processing speed in the graphics cards, and so those really hold tremendous power in them for... So for a Google car, it isn't that they have some fantastic amount of processing power in the car? I don't think so, no. Uh, I, I don't know the details, but... Yeah, and... Uh, well, well one, one interesting thing with Google, though, is uh, people raise this issue of privacy, and so... the cloud, well, what, what if they not only know what you search for in your email, but also, you know, where you've been every second of every day? But they pretty, pretty much do it now. Like if you have a phone with a, what's it called, a Google Latitude. If you have it enabled, they can know where you are. And sometimes that works to your benefit. Sometimes people are concerned that they're collecting information for advertisements and marketing. But yeah, it's just one thing to think about. Uh, this is maybe a, a good time to to stop. Good. But I'd like to to thank you for this is. Very interesting. So thank you very much. Thank you. This is our next thing of coming to the Science Cafe, where we're doing this again. We're doing two more this uh, this semester, one in two weeks, one in four weeks. The next one is Heather Bradshaw.
And she's a highly entertaining speaker. I, I strongly recommend. It's going to be on the census and differences between people um, in terms of, of our, our various senses. I strongly recommend her as a speaker. So uh, definitely make two, two weeks' time. Thanks for also, I guess if you'd like to be on our mailing list, um, you know, please write down your, uh, your no, we, we won't uh, sell your name unless someone offers us a lot of money. Well, they, they, they killed a lot of cones before they shot this video.